Accessories that add second screens to phones, tablets, or handhelds are nothing new. For many years, LG and ASUS created excellent versions for their phone lines. More recently, Mechanism's phone mount even turned tablets and Android phones into universal second screens. The problem is that those solutions either only fit a single family of devices or come with drawbacks to usability or portability. Hence, many folks are still waiting for an extra screen that they can just clip onto any handheld to play DS, 3DS, or maybe even Wii U games without too much hassle. Fortunately, that wait might be over, thanks to a new dual-screen accessory released by Retroid. Although primarily meant to work with their non-flip, non-classic pocket devices, they do advertise the display as potentially working with other handhelds. So let's take a moment to plug the display into some random devices, see what it works with, and determine if it's enough to scratch the itch for folks interested in dual screen emulation. To start, let's take a look at the specs. This is a 5.5 inch 1080p AMOLED display. Its only inputs are a USB-C port for display in and a USB-C port for pass-through charging. It also has no internal battery, making it extremely light. On the left-hand side, we have the only buttons on the display. They increase or decrease the display brightness. This is an important inclusion to make sure that it's as close as possible to the brightness on the device it's attached to. I would have loved to also have seen an on-screen menu or additional buttons to manage color, temperature, and rotation. You know, if folks from Retroid happen to see this, Maybe that's a good idea for version 2. A decent feeling hinge attaches the display to whatever device you have on hand. I have no problem with its general feel, although it does tend to snap shut with a bit of force. For folks planning to use this display long term, I might recommend getting some rubber feet for the edges of the display to absorb any shock if that snap does feel too rough. The clip itself feels reminiscent of something I might use to attach a controller to a phone. Rubber pads the inside to help with grip and slippage. Meanwhile, the clip's jaws stretch to fit any objects between around 90 millimeters and 118 millimeters tall. There are even cutouts in the material to work around any buttons. All in all, it's not a bad setup for $70, even if I wish the monitor itself had just a few more features. The display is a good size to pair with handhelds. A 1080p OLED is always welcome, and the clip feels very secure when latched onto properly sized devices. There are few ways Retroid could have done better with the hardware itself without introducing additional trade-offs, cost, or complexity. Even still, the hardware specs do immediately highlight some limitations for usage beyond Retroid's intended devices. At its shortest, the clip's still too wide to mount onto a phone. At its widest, it's not quite wide enough to fit over my Lenovo Legion Go S without modifying the clip. Testing a bunch of different devices I have on hand, I found that the Ambernic RG Cube is just about the smallest device that comfortably fits. Meanwhile, a Steam Deck is the largest device before I feel like I'd break the clip. Though, to be honest, the screen size might be a bit too small for a larger device anyway. If you have something the size of an original Legion Go, you might be better off just leaning on Mechanism's phone mount to mount a second display anyway. Smaller devices do have a bit more leeway. If you were really dedicated, phone clips with flat backs can be added to larger phones, smaller handhelds, or telescopic controllers to give the display clip enough to grip onto. Of course, uh, depending on the phone clip, uh, this might be a bit less secure than clamping onto a handheld directly, but the display is light enough to allow for a bit of wobbling without falling off. Just remember that this is a USB-C display that needs to have a wired connection. If the solid bits on the display clip's top obstruct any ports, you're gonna be out of luck. Meanwhile, if you're using a telescopic controller, you'll need to get some right angle adapters to route cables appropriately. But even if you've met 
all those requirements to make a device physically fit, you might still run into a snag. To be usable, a device needs to not only provide display out via its USB-C port, but also provide power to the display. That's not too big a deal if you have a modern Android handheld or handheld PC, but cheaper Linux handhelds likely don't have the right hardware for the job. Similarly, many smartphones won't provide a display out signal unless they're also receiving external power. Others, like my Fold 4, Galaxy S20 Plus, or ROG Phone 3, have difficulty recognizing the external display at all. Even getting past all that, uh, many devices might run into issues thanks to Retroid opting for a rotated display, to which they've applied additional software tweaks. Plugging in my iPhone 16 Pro Max, uh, the display mirrors my phone fine, uh, just rotated 90 degrees. That rotation stays in place even when playing games via Delta and makes it just about unusable for real gameplay. iOS isn't alone either. I've seen a few Reddit threads showing the same result with AYN's Odin devices. My own Retroid Pocket Flip 2 and Surface Duo also don't quite know how to handle the display. Based on Retroid's GitHub page for the add-on, it looks like fixing this issue would require a patch to how devices interpret the display. They do at least provide instructions on how Android devs could fix the issue via the Surface Flinger component. Unfortunately, that didn't mean that phones will likely never be compatible, at least without uh, quite a bit of tinkering or a dedicated community effort. Similarly, random Android handheld manufacturers won't have incentive to support a competitor's accessory. The only potential non-Retroid company that I could see issuing a patch might be AYN, since they and Retroid share the same parent company. So yeah, don't expect to buy this display for most Android handhelds and have a seamless experience right out the box. Now, fortunately, there is at least a temporary fix named SF Rotate. This community developed script loads a patch to Surface Flinger into a device's memory. This means it needs to be run every time the handhelds turn on. It also means there's limited impact if something goes awry with the script for whatever reason. After running the script on my Flip 2, everything works as intended. Folks on Reddit have also suggested it works with AYN's Odin 2 and Ioneo's Pocket Ace. The main marker for compatibility is being able to run the script as root on a particular device. If that's not possible on your handheld of choice, it uh, might not be worth the hassle. Still, all this is at least some way to expand usage to more Android devices, even if it's still kind of janky. On the brighter side, if you have a Windows or SteamOS handheld PC, the display works just fine. There's a, still the same rotation issue, but both operating systems have built-in tools to handle it. So it's really a non-issue with these more mature devices. In fact, Windows might be the best operating system for this add-on. When first plugging it into my Surface Pro 11, I noticed the touch recognition was rotated. Fortunately, Retroid provides an executable to apply a firmware fix and rotate it correctly. After the fix, it works excellently. If you had a small Windows tablet or handheld PC running Windows, this could be a great way to add a second screen, either for gaming, watching videos, or keeping an eye on chats as you play. Just note that if you're not planning to play on a Windows machine, Windows is still required to change the orientation of the touchscreen. Retroid only provides Windows executables to flash the firmware. Furthermore, you'll need to plug the display into a device that recognizes it as a USB-C display. Before updating with my Surface Pro, I tried plugging it into my iNeo AM1, both with the front USB-C port and back USB-A ports. In either case, Retroid's tool failed to recognize the display as connected because it wasn't being treated as an external display. Again, probably won't be necessary to know unless you're already planning to play on Windows or find it'll help with a random mobile OS. Now, if you don't wanna faff about with all that and just want something that'll work with little tinkering, I 
might recommend just trying the display with a Steam Deck. Despite Retroid advertising that the Steam Deck's not supported, it's the one handheld I've tested that easily mounts and connects to the display without issue. Using Retroid's display as a stand-in for DS, 3DS, or Wii U bottom screens takes a bit of getting used to, but feels comfortable once I got the hang of it. Playing Mario Kart while having the map and item info just above my screen feels oddly more natural than its typical position. Menus in Pokemon still feel a bit awkward even after a couple hours, but it's largely unobtrusive. Except for the instances where cutscenes span displays, of course. All in all, it's a great time. This might be the easiest portable dual screen setup I've used for a Steam Deck yet. Although, I will say it's not perfect. There is the hassle where the touchscreen doesn't scale properly, a problem I've faced with external displays on Arch Linux before. That means you won't exactly be playing Pokemon Ranger or anything with this display anytime soon. Not that you'd really want to, given the size constraints. On any other device, that'd be a deal breaker. The Steam Deck's built a bit different, though. Due to the weight and dimensions of my Steam Deck, there's never been a moment where lifting a hand off controls to touch the screen felt more convenient than just using the touchpad to simulate touch via mouse click. The speed, haptics, and sensitivity of the pads combined with mouse click's register to back buttons work great for quickly jumping through menus or selecting attacks. It's still not going to be ideal for extremely touch-heavy games. Most of the DS and 3DS library should play just fine, though, and Wii U games will only suffer if they really utilize gyro a ton, which might feel awkward here. It actually works so well that I wonder if any other handheld PC without the touchpads could actually offer a better experience for gameplay, even with the touchscreen problem solved. Which kind of leads us to a funky place. The one device Retroid specifically calls out as not supported is potentially the best device to use with their display outside their own handhelds. And honestly, I love the idea of a lightweight third-party accessory that increases the versatility of Steam Decks even further. Since launch, Steam Decks have proved a surprisingly good system to modify for dual-screen emulation due to its specific form factor and versatile touchpads. It kind of makes me wish that Retroid would actively create a larger display for handheld PCs with Steam Decks in mind. Because if I could comfortably use Retroid's display as the top display, that'd be fantastic, especially if Retroid still sold it for under $100. Outside the Steam Deck, Windows handhelds around the Steam Deck's size seem the way to go here. With Retroid's firmware update, their display works perfectly with Windows. Given the fact that the only dual-screen Windows handheld on the market costs a thousand plus dollars, buying a Retroid display alongside an Asus ROG Ally may even be a cost-effective setup for folks looking for something portable for dual-screen emulation but more capable than the upcoming Android clamshells. The unfortunate part about all this is the broad incompatibility with Android and iOS devices. When I pre-ordered this display, I was kind of hoping it'd be a cheap alternative to more proprietary second screen systems on LG and Asus's phones. Not to mention, with how well it fits a Surface Duo, it would have been great to have a way to increase usability of Duos with a single broken display. That's just not the case, though. Compatibility with mobile OSs appears tied to updates for the device themselves, which won't be coming for most systems. As a current stopgap, SF Rotate works well for making more Android handhelds up bit more usable, but it's still a far cry from the display being as plug-and-play as it should be. What's here is good though, and I'm hoping that maybe Retroid will release a revision with buttons on the device to toggle orientation instead of relying on software fixes. But who knows if that'll ever come, or if there's a reason they haven't done so already. For now, if you're interested in picking up Retroid's display, but not their handhelds, 
Try it with a Steam Deck or Windows machine for the most seamless experience. Those are my thoughts though. Now's the time when I ask for yours. Have you tried out Retroid's dual screen add-on with other devices and want to share your performance results? Or are you interested in picking up the display but have additional questions? Let me know down in the comments. As always, if you have found this video helpful or informative, go ahead and give it a like to let me know, and then get subscribed for more handheld tech videos in the near future. That's going to be all for this video, though. Thank you so much for watching all the way until the end. Until next time, catch you later.